Gal show is ghetto. Allegedly. This your girl, Rum Judy. You are now tuned in on the Check On Your People show. Today we have Miss Linda Franks in the building. Thank you for watching. Good morning. Good morning, Miss Linda. How you doing? I'm doing blessed. I'm blessed to be here with you, beautiful girl. I'm also blessed to be here with you, beautiful woman. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Linda, so let's get started. Can you tell us about yourself going back to your childhood and where you come from? Well, I am a 1968 baby. Ooh. You know, they always say that 68 was one of the most pivotal years in history. I was born August the 20th, 1968 in Mobile, Alabama. Ooh. My mother, Linda Henderson, and my father, Leon Lamont Johnson, uh, have four children. I am the baby of the, um, my father went into the army shortly after my, uh, my oldest brother was born. And of course, back in those days, you got married. When you got someone pregnant, you got married. She was 16 and uh, he was 19 and he went into the army. That was during the time of the Vietnam War. So I pretty much grew up uh, traveling with my father. Uh, some people call that being an army brat or a military I read you brat. was an army brat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, and I just, uh, um, the experience there, of course, I was very young, so there's not a lot about living in Germany and living in different places like that that I right. remember. Right. There are some, like, you know, the cobblestone streets, and we would be playing in the playground, and my brother pushed me too hard, and my teeth, my front <laughs> tooth completely cracked in half. Wow. And uh, you got to know my mom was uh, excited when I got five and that tooth got loose that she could pull it out. Um, but we lived in uh, Topeka, Kansas, uh, in Fort Riley, is where my memories of childhood started really kind of coming together. Um, and to be honest, you know, the things that my father had to endure in Vietnam, it made for a volatile household. My mama, uh, there was domestic violence in the house on both sides, Aww. I must add, because a lot of times, you know, our memories and how we perceive our childhood, if there is violence in the house, sometimes it's one-sided. Right. But I've seen my mother give as much as she has right. gotten, and, right. you know. Um, you probably was shell shot from a lot. Yeah, we were very, um, my mom was just a consummate lady. She carried herself in a way that was very classy. Um, and you never would really know uh -huh. what was going on. Uh -huh. But she was very real. So she didn't really hide it as so much as she endured it. And I could say that from my father as well. For my father as well. Uh -huh. um, so we... We left, we left my father and my mother, they split up, and we left in the, um, in the mid-70s, like 70, I would say like 74, um, 75, somewhere around in there, and we moved back to, to Mobile. And so it was a transition because my grandmother died at 37. Wow. By the time she died, she had had 12 children. My mother was the oldest of those 12 children. And um, I'm the sixth child of twelve. Really? Yes, okay. <laughs> All right. That's a good number six. I think uh, my grandmother had had seven girls before she had one boy. My mom had nine girls and three boys. Really? Yeah. That's the same breakdown as my grandmother. Look at that. You got so much in common already. Huh? Yes. So as I did my research, I read that your city, Mobile, Alabama, was enraged by the KKK, and you was. You grew up in this, so can you tell me about that? Oh my God, that was such a, a time. Um, this young, this beautiful black man, Michael Donald, um, was lynched uh, in our city and basically hung in a tree where children went. Can it, see. Was, it was a, it was a bus stop. Mm. I could see it just as if it was, it was yesterday. Um, from what we we understood. Uh, Michael Donald befriended a white girl, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but with that being said, uh, he was targeted um, because the Ku Klux Klan had their initiations, and he was, you know, it was yes. like go out and 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 
excuse my language, people, but I'm just going to be real. It was like pick a nigger, right? Pick right. A nigger, yeah, right. And they lynched him. And we, I mean, in our city was just, and you got to understand the mentality of the South. You know, a lot of us want to talk about being um, removed from the civil rights era, but there was a lot of terrorism going on. You know, there was a right. lot of intimidation going on. And when Michael Donald was, was lynched and murdered, I mean, that just, it was so raw for us. You know, and at the time that they did it, we were coming off of really um, a period of major busing that had gone on, you know, right. where people were being, you know, going, had, had started out in all black schools and now were being intermingled with white right, students right. and different things of that nature. So it was a very, very tense time. Um, me being as young as I was, was, was uh, sheltered from a lot of it, but... You know, I remember us, um, you know, protesting, and I remember us just, you know, there was a feeling of, you know, of wanting to really, really do something right. um, in the community. And I, me growing up, I read a lot on Jim Crow laws, segregation, a lot of stuff like that, and it scared me. So imagine seeing it like, wow, that had to be. It, I mean, and you know, when you when you're in that area. You pass by the tree. You know, you, you're, you're at, like I said, it was, it was done at a bus stop. So the children who had to stand there knowing what had happened there, it was just. They can't do nothing about it. Mm -hmm. Nope, feeling powerless. And how did that affect you in the long run? Like, growing up, just knowing. I've always had a possible. low tolerance for bullies. Mm -hmm. And what I see white supremacy as in our community is bullies, right? Yes, ma'am. So, okay, we can't deny that you have certain power and control, but then you use it right. to intimidate and to right. oppress people. I have no respect for that kind of thing. And so whenever I see these instances of unnecessary violence towards people who are quote-unquote disenfranchised or... Um, in certain areas where people are made to feel like they are less than or have a less of a voice. Right. Um, it infuriates me when I see people in power um, taking advantage of that. Belittling others. Belittling no. others. I mean, you know, hurting people just because they can, murdering and killing people just because they know that historically they've always gotten away with it. And just because I will kill them. That's it. That's just basically it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That, that was a mouthful. Yeah. And I remember working in Mobile. My cousin um, was very active um, in elections, and she worked with the NAACP. Actually, I mar the, uh, my husband, his aunt, has a, uh, a beauty salon um, off of a street called Davis Avenue. That's where the old uh, black area of town where the businesses thrived. And she actually opened the side of her building to the NAACP. So her salon was the first um, office for the NAA, local office of the NAACP. Let's go, sister. Yeah, <laughs> in Mobile. And I actually married into that family. And it's so amazing because I remember coming there um, when our cousin, you know, she was, you know, back in those days, right. when people told right. you to move, when the elders told you to get up, come on, we finna go you do finna this. Get up and <laughs> you finna get up and I don't care if it was picking blackberries <laughs> on the side of the road or if it was, come on, we gonna campaign for this judge. You know, sleeping or all day, you, come on, not you out here, you know, passing out handbills and things like that, you know. But yeah, we, we moved and sometimes we didn't understand why. But we knew that if they told us to do it, that it was something that was important for our community and it was important for our families. We always felt that we were representing our families right. and our people. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me about your dreams of being a loyal? And oh my God, girl, <laughs> you did your research on me. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that fed into my, when I was, like I said, when I was young, when I came from, from you know, living with a, a, so many different places, when I came to Mobile, the first thing is we moved into housing projects. So it was a, it was an adjustment for us, right? Okay. And so then, you know, I'm speaking clearly, 
right? right. I'm enunciating right. and pronouncing my words. Right. So, of course, they told me I sounded like a white girl, right? right? But I'm put back with my people, right? I'm put back with my family, the people that I would come and spend summers with and all of that. But now I'm here all the time. So when I started going to school, I saw how... Like I said, we had just really started integrating the schools. I saw how right. the white teachers spoke to the black students. Right. And so I was defiant. And that's because it was put in our head that we have to be ignorant and we talk ignorant. We They didn't want us with education and knowledge. Exactly. And proper language. Exactly. And so I'm coming in the classroom and I'm speaking and, and you know, I'm they telling shop. the teacher what for. <laughs> and, the, and the white teacher telling me to shut up because I think I'm smart and all of this kind of stuff. But... From that, I grew, like I said earlier, uh, a protective spirit. I hate to see anybody being bullied. And so that was one of the things that made me want to be a lawyer because I understood that the laws were stacked against us. And in order for us to level the playing field, we've got to be in that room speaking truth and we got to know yes. the law so that we can understand how to use it yes. to our advantage because they use it to our disadvantage. So we need people in that profession who are justice minded and are and want to speak out yes. for the injustices in the law, you know, because I'm going to tell you something. They, they've written the laws for themselves. They can manipulate them the way that they want to if you are ignorant to the yes. law. But you once you no understand the law, you... baby, they can't tell they can't touch you because now you're using their system against yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. So you're putting that, a them on them. <laughs> yeah. So that made me want to be a lawyer and the fact that my mom also studied pre law after we got back to Mobile. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Miss Linda, what brought you to Baton Rouge, Louisiana? <laughs> Honey, a series of events, but <laughs> um, and I'm this, here for them all. this is a testament to black love, I will say. I met my husband in 1989. I was, uh, I was actually a nursing student at that time, and he had just gotten back from the military, and he was working as a security guard. Mm -hmm. And a mutual friend of ours, um, I was getting a ride home with her, was standing there talking to him, and um, and oddly enough, we had gone to the same high school but never knew you each other. You still Yeah, I am. <laughs> and I walked by him and he said, don't walk by me like you don't know who I am. And I tell everybody that a man that finds the wife finds a good thing, most of the time your husband's going to know you before you know who he yes. is. And I always joke with him now when he says that, don't walk by me like you don't know who I am. When in reality, I did not know who he was. But with that being said... Uh, from that day, we had our first date, and we've been together ever since. Wow. Yeah, we've been it's together ever possible. since. possible. Yeah. So after I became a nurse, I worked as an LPN for a while, and then I went back to school to get my RN. I was falsely accused of abusing a patient in my care. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I was working at a nursing facility during that time. I'm going through a false accusation right now. Oh, well, let me encourage you, baby. God is real. But let me tell you what I do understand. The white power structure told me I would never nurse again. And right now I am the owner of a hair salon. Just let them just let you sit with that for a second. Right. But I was falsely accused um, and had no way to defend myself. I did not know during that time how to even, there was no one that I could reach out for. I advocated for myself and a couple of other ladies um, that was caught up in this situation, um, but they were intimidated. They were nursing assistants at this time, and they felt that if they let the charge land on me, that I was more adept at landing on my feet yeah. than them. Right. And one of them has since uh, passed away and was able to apologize to me. Um, and, and I've forgiven. But with that being said, um, losing my nursing career, because I pleaded that, I pleaded that case down. I did. And what I didn't realize at the time, I was given some bad information. My lawyer did not know or would not help me. That was wow. one of the things that as you know, we get further into talking about my life that you'll understand why I chose um, certain legal representation like I did. Yes. Um, but with that being said, my husband and I, we just, you know, God allowed us no matter where we went to prosper. He was able to, to get a job where um, it trans purported him, transferred him to, to New Orleans. He was working in Harahan, Louisiana. So that's how we got to Louisiana, yes. right? 
Then they moved us to Little Rock, Arkansas to open up a bit, uh, um, one of the satellites for the company that he was working for. And that's where I got my, you know, my cosmetology license and all of that. And then two years they after They say when that, he closed one though, he will open it. When I one. tell you, that's why I want you to be encouraged because sometimes, you know, things will move in a direction we don't understand at the particular yes. time. Yes. But we have to stay true and have to stay, stay faithful to know that we have a God that, you know, um, that is in control yes. of us. And when we avail ourselves and are trying to do what is right. And see, I'm sitting across from you and I'm feeling your power. Yes. And you're here and you're doing these things. So that lets me know that you're in a vein yes. where you want to speak out and really want to be about the people and about justice and about, you know, educating. So the enemy is going to come after yes. you. But you got to stand firm. And I'm kind of happy this happened because now... I just feel like my blessings finna start pouring in because mm -hmm. I've been through so much with them people and mm -hmm. it's like, I'm just happy. Like, I'm happy. Yeah, and I want my people to know that. You know, that's why I don't stand in judgment of my people and the work that I do because I've had to plead down to a case. I know what it feels like yes. to be accused of something that you didn't do. And there's something that was so against your character. Ooh. Me to hurt someone that I was caring for, people who know me knew that I would not do that. But I also you know, understood where they were in their lives and some people don't want to jeopardize themselves mm -hmm. to help others. And unfortunately, that's what it's going to take if we're going to move forward. But 2005, and I'm going to tell you how God worked, yes. we moved from Kenner, Louisiana in June of 2005. That's two months before Katrina. Ooh. So I was put in a position in Little Rock because I was working for a company called Brana Brothers, selling hair care products. I know y'all heard of the Brana yeah, Brothers yes, hair yes. show and whatnot like that. So I was one of their regional managers. So when the people started coming from uh, New Orleans, from Katrina, I know how important it is for Louisiana girls to have their hair yes, done, baby. Yes, Don't you, gotta, <laughs> you know, in tragedy and all, yes. but you're going to want that hair you looking good. Your hair <laughs> and I wasn't doing hair at that time, but God had blessed me to meet a hairstylist who, had, had, who was, was not practicing. Yes. And from going from salon to salon, I had met a guy who had a barbershop. And he allowed us to use his barbershop, and I, um, I persuaded Bronner Brothers to... Um, to donate supplies and we were able to undergird ladies coming in to get their hair right. done for free while they were there after Katrina. And so then in 2007, the company moved us from Little Rock to Baton Rouge. And so that's how hey, we here. got, yeah, I've been in Baton Rouge here since 2007. So yeah. how, how you like Baton Rouge when you first came? What was your thoughts? Um, I mean, I was a wife. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm supporting my husband. He's just been moved to this new position. So and I'm starting trying to start my own business right. in a place where I don't know anybody and I don't have any family. Right. And it's service oriented. Right. You gotta so get look, you you got to know people. You yes. got to say, hey, look, this girl can do some hair. You need to go see her. But that's why I say my testimony is all about the grace of God, because yes. I never went into a salon with anyone else. I've always worked by myself um, in a private suite. And I'll never forget it, um, my son Michael and my son Lamar were painting my salon suite. And an older lady came up and she said to me, can you do my hair? She said, I didn't even know y'all were up here. But I, but I looked up and I, and I tell people that because almost every time someone would come into my space, they would say, I didn't even know y'all was here, but I looked up. Mm -hmm. And I just saw that as God winking at me that I had done what he told me to do. And now he was, you know, prospering me in that. And I told her, I said, well, if you don't mind the smell of paint, I'll be happy to do it. And her hair was very damaged. And, I mean, girl, going back, oh, I'm my God, you, let me tell you something. Now this brings to my remembrance the fact that, you know, when I was nine years old in Mobile, Alabama, right, my aunts would come down from Connecticut in the summertime, right, and they would braid our hair. And I'm tender-headed, honey. Oh, my God, I'm tender-headed. <laughs> So I learned how to braid my own hair at the age of nine. I think right. I'm the only one who can part my hair because it hurts. That's it. I'm <laughs> saying it. So but with that being said, when this lady came in, her hair was damaged. I could not in all integrity give her a relaxer. So I told her I could braid her hair. And her being an older lady, yes. of course, you know, not from the day, you know, back 
Yeah, so I had to, on. baby, I had to give her a style that she could wear to church yeah. and she could wear to school. Yes. And I was able to do that. And from that, I got a reputation of doing natural hair and growing hair. And so that established me in Baton Rouge. Uh, I love that for you. Yeah, yeah. That, and, and that's that's an encouragement for young entrepreneurs. Don't ever think that because you are new to a situation. Do what you know to do and do it with integrity. And you will prosper in it. You got to be per You got to persevere. So. You gave me hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've given me hope too, sweetheart. So that's how we got here. That's how, that's how I ended up here. I heard you met your son, Lamar and Michael. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about them? Oh my goodness, I have three sons, amazing sons. Um, Michael is my oldest. Um, Lamar, who is no longer with us. Um, and Carl, which is named after his father. And, um, they my are name just... Carnesha, my dad named Carl. Really? <laughs> Look, if I had a daughter, I was gonna name her Carlesha. Girl, you know how we do. My grandfather named Carl, I got an auntie named Carlesha. Yeah, yeah, but I made sure that I named my sons after someone that was very close to me. Michael is named for his father, which is not my husband. But um, he loved Michael Jackson. And so when Michael was born, I didn't want to name him Byron. <laughs> so I named him Michael, Michael and I allowed his uncle to, to give him his middle name. Lamar is named after my brother. My brother is a junior, but when he went to California, he changed his name to Lamar. With some issues, you know how we have family issues. Yes. And um, he uh, named his, changed his name to Lamar. So Lamar is actually named for my oldest brother. And Alexander, which is his middle name, is for my stepfather, who really just, I feel like, came into our lives yes. and blessed yes. us and blessed me at an age where I really needed a father. Yes. And um, Fix what he didn't break. Oh, my God. He was just a, such an amazing man. And so I named Lamar for him. And then, of course, Carl is named after his his father. And his middle name is for his father's best friend. So, you know, in our community, we our names <laughs> need to have meaning. I know people yes. want to always talk about what's going on and doing that and that. But, you know, we're a culture where we, you know, we, we name, we, names mean something, right? Yeah. Because I'm Carnisha Denise, and Denise come from my dad and mom. Yes. Yeah, so. See, ancestry. Yeah. I'm Linda, named after my mom, to the letter. And Louise is my grandmother, Geraldine. Louise is her middle name. But I'm a junior, actually. So, oh. Yeah, when my dad came back from, um, from Vietnam, they thought that my mom was going to die with me because I was sucking oh. all her blood out. I don't know, maybe that's why I'm so fabulous. But in any case, <laughs> <laughs> they got him home. This is how he got home from Vietnam on an emergency furlough leave because they thought that his wife was gonna die in childbirth. Wow. And so that brought my daddy home. I brought my daddy home from, from Vietnam. And my mom said, okay, you know what we're gonna name him? And he said, I want two Lindas. So, and Linda means beautiful in Spanish. And you are beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so there's a lot of history there. But yeah, so my sons are Michael, Lamar, and Carl. And I, now I want to get into May of 2015 when tragedy struck. Yeah. That morning, i never forget it. Um, I was actually asleep. I mean, I was, fixing, I was in the process of waking up to get myself mm -hmm. ready to go to work and I knew I had to go get my mom. My mom was living with me at that time and she was on dialysis. She was a dialysis patient. She was going to uh, the dialysis clinic out in Baker. And so Lamar came into my room and um, the mother of his children, they were estranged at that time. She was living in New Orleans and Lamar and the children were here. Mm -hmm. But she had come and they had reconciled and they had spent the night together, whatever. But so he was in good spirits when he came and like I everything him, happened though. for a reason. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. And I often tell her that, you know, one of the comforts of my life is knowing that the night before he got arrested, that he had spent making love to the woman that he cared about, the mother of his children. Yeah. And that means a lot. Because it, it could have been different. It could have definitely been different, you know, to know that he had that opportunity. Um, but he came and he knocked on my door and he said, Mom, I'm going to go pick up girl. I'm going to go pick up Mama. Mm -hmm. Well, we called her, he called her Mooney. I'm going to go pick up Mooney from dialysis. He really wanted her to finally meet um, the kid. The kid's mother. No, oh, the wow. kid's always been with him. <laughs> Lamar loved his children. Yes. They were always, almost always with him. And um, I'm an alpha grandmother. Yes. I don't play that. I know I'm, 
you know, sometimes when you the the daddy's mom, right? You, you saw it move. You understand what I'm talking about? But that ain't in my world. I I, I took my daughter along. They got a post that say nobody like the grandma on the day. <laughs> that's a well, that's a lie. I know, that's <laughs> a lie. <laughs> you know, I made sure that I I took these young ladies to 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 lunch and met them and loved them yes. and told them that we have a relationship that we got to deal with and it's got to start now. Because I can't have you. They taking need my more baby. women like this. Like you know. they really do. A lot of stuff would be different. A lot of kids would be close to family. Yeah, family has to be the most important thing. And I encourage grandmothers to to look at it that way. Yes. You know, even though we have this idea of how families and we want families to be started, oh, you got to get married and then you have a baby. But we got to be honest. That ain't real. That ain't reality, right? right. That's not how things normally are happening, unfortunately, because of the family structure. But with that being said, who's to say that you're not a family just because right. you're not It'll be nice, but it don't happen like that for yeah, everybody. Yeah, you know, and I and I relate because I feel I remember what it was like being 17 years old and being pregnant, right? Still yes. in high school. I remember what it was like being 19 years old in college, not married, but with the same guy. Right? So I'm not having babies with different people, but that connotation in our community, right? But what I want you to know is we're all family. Because yes. one of the things that I loved about my husband was that he never separated my children from their father. In fact, he go pick them up so they could go to football games to watch the boys play together. And so that's kind of where I was was raised and reared in. Yeah. We didn't say stepchildren. We didn't do all of that. And so when it came time for my grandchildren, Oh, you ain't keeping my grandkids from me. <laughs> right. And anybody that knows me knows. Because that's the value of family. All that falls in the it value It definitely family. is. But he really wanted his grandmother to meet her. Mm -hmm. She's a beautiful, hardworking uh, girl, woman, excuse me. Um, she's in New Orleans. And um, she had all day, they was holding it down. They were holding it down. It got into a rough patch. And he came to stay with us for a while, um, but they were reconciling. I like to believe that they, yes. when if they wasn't, that's their business, yes. right? I'm one of the mamas, I believe, and yes. that's your business, you know. So he came in that morning and he said, I'm gonna go get Mooney, and I'm gonna go pick her, pick her up from, from dialysis. And I just thought to myself, oh baby, thank you, because I really didn't feel like getting up early, you know, <laughs> and all of that. And so um, I knew it was taking him a while to get back. So by the time I had gotten dressed and was on my way to work, I got a phone call and it was from the arresting officer. And he told me that Lamar was being arrested uh, for, an out, for a traffic ticket and for an out, a warrant out of Jefferson Parish. He told me not to worry. He said, you know, this 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 guy's a you know a stand up guy. He's been honest with me, you know, and me and him been talking. I know he's got his head on right. And actually, you know, this may be a blessing for him because he really wanted to get from up underneath the ticket charge. Because yes. he never really knew about the warrant from Jefferson Parish yes. until he was arrested. Um, but he was calling me because he knew that my mom would need a ride from. Yeah, he from wanted dialysis. to let you know that he didn't make it. And also, he said, because I'm not going to impound the car. And so I want, you know, Lamar's uh, fiance or his girlfriend to know that she can come to the Baker Police Department, tell the receptionist to let her go in my office. The keys are in the desk so that she can get the car. The car was parked at the CVS on Groom and, um, what is that? Uh, no, Groom Road. No. Was, is it Groom? I'm not sure. But the, it's a CVS right there in Baker. Oh, Main Street? Main I, Street. I know exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it was right up, it's, it was right in that area. Um, so I went on to work, you know. Um, a little bit later on that day, uh, Lamar called me. I called my husband and everybody because you know I'm about to yes. jump into place. I'm yes. like, who I know is a lawyer. You're my baby. I'll what? <laughs> we about to do this, right? Uh, but because they had him on a warrant, they called it a fugitive warrant, I guess a failure to appear or whatever. Um, we couldn't bond him out until he was Since transported to Jefferson, to Jefferson yeah. Parish. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, so he called me and he said, Mom, you know, he said, um, it's just a traffic ticket, some little low-level warrant. He said, don't worry about it. When I see the judge, I'm sure everything going to be all right, you know. He said, and I'm glad it's finally happened because I knew I had that ticket. I should have paid it. He said, but, um, you know, that's what's been keeping me from 
you know, getting his tweet card and stuff. He wanted to go work and his different things like that. So it was just a very optimistic call. Yeah. And so that set into a course of a, a, a set of events. I kept calling to see how much his bond would be, how much his bond would be. And so that must have been on a Tuesday. So Wednesday I talked to him. He said he was fine. Thursday, and this haunts me right now, I got a call, but I missed the call. I was doing somebody's hair, and I missed the call. And when I called back, it was a call from correctional facility. So I knew it was a call from the parish, and I missed that call. And I never got a call from my son again. Never got a call from there again. And so now I'm realizing that this was Memorial Day weekend, right? So by Thursday, I'm tripping. I'm just straight out like, why haven't they transporting him? What is going on? Why, why is nobody telling me anything? Why can't we get him a bond? And the people at the jail are saying um, uh, he hasn't been transported yet for uh, you know, reasons or mm. logistical reasons or whatever. And so Friday, I called. I was calling back and forth from Jefferson Parish to Baton Rouge. Jefferson Parish to Baton Rouge trying to get some status. Have they moved him yet? Has he been booked in in Jefferson Parish? So by Friday, my husband said, look, we're not going to be able to do anything until, you know, Monday or Tuesday anyway. Mm -hmm. He's going to be fine. You know how Lamar is. Lamar probably done befriended everybody in that place, guards and people are like, he's going to be mm -hmm. good. We, you know, we'll, we'll, we can, we'll, we'll deal with it. And so we went about our weekend. Now, I didn't know that Saturday my son was dead. I did not know. And I think back now I had done a hair show that day, uh, Saturday. I had some young ladies working with me in the salon. I had them on a program that I had developed in my salon where I went and got new uh, graduates from um, cosmetology school. Yeah. And I would allow them to work with me for a year. Right. Because God had blessed me, I just had overflow. So I could give them clients. Yes. I could teach them how to take care of natural hair. Step and then I the had, uh, yeah. yeah. And I had this amazing woman, Reverend Alexis Anderson, working with me. And we did business classes. So they learned the business. They learned how to take care of people. And so on that day, we were actually out doing a, a hair show. Demonstrating uh, natural and healthy hair techniques. And after that, we, me and my husband and some friends of ours went to the beach. And I never knew that that morning, my, that's when they found my son. Oh, wow. I never knew that. And so we went the whole weekend, you know, um, me calling. But, of course, it's a Saturday. It's a Sunday. And so then Monday we went actually to New Orleans because we would be closer to Jefferson Parish. And I'm like, okay, as soon as they transport, we're going. Not realizing that was Memorial Day. So we got to run around that day. And I'm just frustrated at this time. So Tuesday morning, I'm waking up bright and early. I need to talk to someone. Mm -hmm. And I think that because of my, the way that I speak and because I had spoken with so many people, I had um, familiarity with folks. They thought I was Lamar's. They must have thought I was Lamar's lawyer. Um, they told me, they said, um, he can't be transported because he's in the hospital. So that's how we were notified that Lamar, they couldn't tell me what had happened to him. Mm -hmm. All they could say that was that he was in the hospital. And so that's how we went about then trying to figure out what had happened and where he was. What caused him to get in the hospital? Y'all don't tell you everything but that. Yeah, so that, that that was a very, very hard, hard time because the disrespect began that. So sore. Yeah, yeah. I had to find out on my own where he was, you know. and. That's why I say your gift will make room for you, and you will be amazed at how God will orchestrate things and put people in your yes. life that you don't even realize. But my clientele was such that I called a few people, and one of them was someone that worked at Our Lady of the Lake. And I told her, I said, no, you can't give me any confidential information, but my son is somewhere mm -hmm. in that hospital, and I need to know where he is. And when she told me he was in neuro ICU, my medical background told me that he had had some type of head injury and that it was serious because he was in ICU. So me and my husband at that time, we went to the hospital. When we went to the neuro ICU, we were turned around, we were told that we would have to have permission to see him. And I was given the number for the warden at the parish jail. Wow. I walked downstairs, went outside in the front of, of Our Lady of the Lake, and that man told me, well, your son tried to hang himself. That he said it just as blatantly as that over the telephone. 
And I'm thinking, what in the world? Your spirit ain't even let you believe it. I mean, you got to understand, I've raised this boy 27 years. Suicide? Never. He was the one that was always encouraging people. He was the one that was always dispelling disputes and um, bringing people back together. A, 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 a resolution expert he was. He could turn any atmosphere from conflict to cooperation with just a smile and a few words the way he... Not only that, he just told you don't worry, so why would he try to go harm himself? And you see how me and you talking, honey. Let me tell you something. I didn't withhold nothing from my kids. I talk to them just like to my grandkids like this. Because yes. I know this world. We have to be real with our children. We can't be so much trying to dominate every aspect of their lives when we know they're going to go out and be individual human beings. So we talked about drugs. We talked about sex. We talked about suicide. We talked about everything. And we talked about it in a flow. Not in a, okay, come on, sit down, and I'm going to give you this. No, we talked about it in context of everyday life. So I know suicide was something he would never even have. Could. And why? He was just reconciling with the woman that he loved. He was in a place where he was resolving something that he felt was holding him back. Why in the world would he give up on life like that? Right? Right. So then he told me that, now he just said my son, but then he told me that I would have to come to the jail and prove that Lamar was my son before I could even go up and see him. So as a mother, I'm standing in front of this hospital knowing my baby is in there somewhere in an ICU unit and now somebody is telling me that I cannot see them. I'm going home in a frenzy. I'm looking, I've given Lamar all of his paperwork. By this time, you know, of course, Adrian is back in New Orleans. And so I don't know what, I don't even know where his important papers are. So I go to my file box and I go through and I find his, his, his baby things. You know, pictures of his foot, you know, on that, that birth announcement. And I was able to find, um, his shot record from where he, you know, kindergarten and school. And I got that and I got my my marriage license to prove that my husband was who he was. And we went to the parish to prove to the warden that we were his parents so that we could go and see him. And when I got there, they told me I could, my husband couldn't come in. They said I had to go in by myself. So I had to face this man by myself who, instead of just saying, Miss Franks, I'm so sorry for what happened to me. We're going to do our best to try to figure out what's going on. We'll right. be in contact with you. What he told me was, yeah, you're going to need to go in there by yourself because uh, we find in some of these cases that, you know, when family members go in, they uh, they get a, it, they get upset. So I'm wondering what you mean when they go in and see what? So why would so I have to come by myself if I'm going to get upset? <laughs> Girl, look, and not only that, do you know this man told me you can, you'll be able to see him for 15 minutes at this time. You can go back to the hospital at this time. You know, I mean, instead of being compassionate and saying, I'm going to call and make sure that you are able to see your son that you are able to get whatever it is that you need, you know, just call me. It's, you can't go back until two o'clock, you know, and then when you go back, you're gonna have 15 minutes to see him in adherence with the, you know, this and that and the third, and you can't go in with your husband. Your husband gotta stay outside. That's cause they don't care till it's them. So you telling this man that has raised this, that has raised his son, because when me and Carl met, Lamar was like 18 months old. So that's his that's son. Daddy. That's right. his son. And now we're standing out here and we can't go in to see him. And so then when we did, were able to go, when I was able to go and see him, um, he was on life support at that time. He was on life support. You know, they were telling me that he wasn't going to survive, but, you know, I, I wasn't ready to give up right then. Yes. Yeah. And um, some days later, we found out that the warrant was outdated that it never should have even been in the system to begin with. Um, and so the charges, of course, were dropped. And um, and that's when we were able as a family to come in and, mm -hmm. and to see Lamar um, before we decided to take him off of life support. And did y'all ever like get any type of closure with that? Or is there remain? Well, from a, like I said, God's hand is always I, I just see it in everything. And, and so after that, I mean, you just don't know what to do. You just, you don't know who to talk to. And at that time, there was no one that I knew that I could really call. 
I just was blessed to have Reverend Alexis Anderson in my life during that time. She's always been an advocate mm -hmm. for the community. Um, her organization, Preach, um, you know, before even Lamar died, was 20 years old by that time. And, and she always uh, talks about her Rolodex to die for, but she, she, she was there with me. She's a personal friend of the family. And her son, Quentin, he really gave us some structure. He was like, okay, let's, 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 we, we gotta get these questions answered, right? Yes. So, uh, Reverend Anderson um, orchestrated a meeting between uh, then Senator, State Senator Broom, um, Regina Barrow, and Denise Marcel. We met with them to tell them what we knew, what, you know, what had happened. Um, we, you know, we just, we, we did all that we could locally to advocate for an investigation yes. for Lamar. We started a change.org petition to get as many signatures as we could to force May, then Mayor uh, uh, Kip Holden to open an in, uh, independent investigation. We organized a march um, to City Hall and we had people coming from Mobile, from New Orleans that knew uh, Lamar you know, all justice for yes. Lamar. So we begin that. What what God did was I married him to an amazing family. And within that family was someone who had some connections to an organization that would undergird us yes. for the money that we needed to hire yes. a law firm. So there again, my experience early on where I had to plea, I knew I didn't want to deal with nobody that was local. Because the I don't know. corruption, Who the trust at this you point? don't know. I don't know. Who, you really don't know yes. who's been compromised by whatever reason. And I don't judge people because I don't yes. know what they are doing, what they do for. But I try to think about doing right for right's sake. So yes. I went with a firm out of Savannah, Georgia, called the uh, Claiborne Firm. And uh, David Utter and Will Claiborne became um, our lawyers. And in the we retained them to investigate what happened to yes. Lamar. And so that just, you know, that's how that kind of got started. And from there, they they really helped because they were more about, you know, when we see some of these things happening in the news, the first thing that the media wants to highlight is somebody's rap sheet. Uh, they want to highlight, oh, you know, where they come from. pictures and you understand what I'm going from game signs yes, and stuff like yes. that. And, and they were more interested in, let's talk about who Lamar They say was. everything about how he was a good father, Amen. a great son. Yeah. I don't care what my child did. That's my child. Amen. <laughs> that's it. And you know, that's what our community has to really understand. That this system has always been uh, targeting us. Yes. I don't understand how it is that we think that we ever were getting a fair shot from this system, right? It is always from the black codes, from the way that the police patrols yes. began. It's always been about oppressing and, and using our bodies for this legal system is gained. Mm -hmm. so I don't know why we trust those things. I mean, so, I mean, that's kind of how um, I really got enthralled in in active, actively being out in these streets about what's going on mm -hmm. in, in, in criminal justice reform here in Baton Rouge, you know. And I, I, I want to add, you know, that um, we, we didn't get the autopsy report for Lamar. I mean, little things like we contact the media and they said, oh, we don't, we don't um, we don't report on on suicides. So you couldn't get any any media coverage of the story. And if it hadn't been for Eugene Collins, he started a Facebook Shut campaign. Up, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about it. I mean, because we look at how things come full circle, yeah. you know. And when I think about the vitality of the youth that came out, I mean, y'all know social media, honey. Let me tell you something. And they started getting on Facebook. They started calling the coroner's office to get Lamar's autopsy reports um, released. And it moved the needle. It moved yes. the needle. I, I, will, I am forever grateful um, for that, you know, and the things that happened. Just like I said, Quentin being a young man and knowing how to navigate through social media and, and talk to people 
um, about what was going on, how to get the story out is so important because a lot of times we suffer in silence. In our community, we want to make, be made to feel like we have something to be ashamed of because our loved one may be down at that parish or may be caught up in a situation. Mm. But just like you said, you're still my child. Yes. You're still my child. And we've got to we've got to lift that up. We've got to be bully beaters. And I don't care what nobody do, they don't deserve to die. No. To my understanding, did you ever hear back from the arresting officer? Actually, you know, that's that's very interesting because we were in the process of getting our home ready to receive people because of Mark from out of yeah. town. So we're in this furniture store and I get a telephone call and it's the arresting officer. And he's calling me and he's saying that he was just calling me to check on and to see how Lamar was doing, if he had gotten out, if he, you know, had gotten the thing resolved. Kind of like, I'm just kind of checking up on him. Yeah. He made such an impression on me. And when I told that man that Lamar, you know, what had happened, and by that time Lamar was still on life support, he literally broke down. He literally got, he said, no, that can't be true. He said, no, he did not do that. That's not true. And he asked my husband and I if it would be okay if he came to the hospital to see Lamar. Yes. We allowed him to come up there to see Lamar. And when he saw Lamar, I mean, he was just distraught. We literally had to to com com comfort him. Yes. He was crying, he was upset. And he told me, he said, don't give up. He said, that could not have happened. He said something to me about the, about the way that the cells were made and how there's no way he could have uh, uh, hung himself yes. that way. Um, but he just kept encouraging me not to give up. And from that, that was one of the things that just made us feel like they're covering up something. If this was just a case of a distraught young man taking his own life, why not open up the books and let us see everything that happened? Yes. Let us see his, his, his mental decline yes. into uh, psychosis or whatever it would have taken. Because I told that warden when I met with him, he said, did Lamar ever have any mental illness? Or I said, nothing ever. Lamar was one of the most together people you were. Let us see the pictures meet. of his neck with the I told him, marks. I said, in order for Lamar to have done this to himself, I said, he would have had to have a complete psychotic break. And then that bears the question, what would have caused that in two or three days? What kind of facility is you running where people come in and in three days, they're, they're, they're you understand yes. what I'm saying? Really, what's going on? It went from going to pick up my grandmother, reconciling with my kid's mother, to killing myself. To killing myself. And telling my mama, don't worry, because everything will be all right. I wanted to do this, to get this to And you're not giving me anything to connect to any dots. All you telling me and what this man told my husband. Make it make sense. Sitting across from him and Reverend Alexis Anderson, when they came to talk to him, he looked my husband in the eye and said, it is what it is. So in other words, your son did just get over it. Let's move on. Life goes on. It is, it is what it is, man. I ain't got nothing for you. Yeah. So, I mean, that is really, and, and you know, that's why I was so bent on not dealing with anyone really locally. Because this arresting officer wanted to recant everything that he had said, right? And then come to find out now he's had some problems in the law. Um, you can, can, can look that up, you know, and I mean, it's just amazing the level of corruption. Yes. Yeah. And that's why people feel hopeless because they like, you know, why even try? That's why they need to change their slogans, protect and serve. Come on. It's, no. Yeah. Yeah. They need to change it fast. And is this where the birth of the Fair Fight Initiative comes from, this situation? Actually, yes, it does. But I have to go back because after that, um, you know, one of the things that, that David and, and, and Will with the Claiborne Law Firm, they were they wanted to know what looked like a win for us. Because a lot of times people think, you know, you're just going to sue and you get this settlement and yes. all of this kind of stuff. But what would look like a win? We didn't want no money. I, I, I tell everybody, families that go and through no this. Ain't no way to work my child Let me tell you life. something. Outside of resurrection, you yes. can't give. So when you see families doing this, they're just trying to get, they're trying to fight 
you know, and this is the only way that is afforded for us to do it. And so we started um, the East Baton Rouge Parish Prison Reform Coalition, a group of families, not just mine, but a group of families. There were 25 people that had died in that facility since 2012. And there were probably about eight of us who came together with some other organizations to form the East Baton Rouge Parish Prison Reform Coalition. We were focusing on that facility. And from that, uh, of of course, the Fair Fight Initiative, because we understood that a lot of times lawyers have to put, and their firms have to put money up front to litigate some of these cases. And a family doesn't have the, the resources to be able to afford that type of legal rep, rep, yes, representation. So go to the- they pretty much have, they're at the mercy of the parish. They're, they're pretty much at the mercy of the sheriff's department or the police department throwing out some number of settlement. And their lawyers yes. are personal injury lawyers. So those are the same types of lawyers that help you when you have a car accident. They don't get paid unless you get paid. So they're more apt if you can't pay them up front to seek a settlement, right? They think they're doing something to recoup what that family member may have lost. But in reality, we want justice, right? We want it uncovered who did what, when, and where, and how they did it. But if you don't have the resources to be able to do that, then you are at the mercy, like I said, of these settlement agreements and different things of that nature. So Fair Fight crowdsources, we crowdfund. And so donations are brought in so that we can hire lawyers. We can pay them up front to take take the cases that are really going to make a difference in reform. So what resources do you guys use for the Fair Fight Initiative? That's exactly that. We use crowdsourced refunds. People call in. You know, think about uh, Kyle Rittenhouse. You mm-hmm. know, the young man that went to, was it Minnesota and killed those two people um, here lately? And he went to trial and got off and everybody was so, you know, and they was talking about how he feared for his life because he was out. He walks into a rally with a gun and shoots two people dead, walk right past the cops, right? Mm-hmm. Well, his legal defense was crowdsourced. That means a lot of people got together, sent them $5 here, $10 here, you know, whatever. But they raised over $2 million for that young man. And who qualified, like, for this for the Fair Fight Initiative? Well, we field calls. People call from all over the country. And we take the merits of the case. We try to see where we can do the most good. We don't want to give out false hope. We really want to make sure that we are taking cases that, for one... That, that we know there has been an injustice mm-hmm. done. We can blatantly see it because in doing that, we can push the needle. It's more about um, reform, yes. setting precedent, right? Mm-hmm. So the Fair Fight Initiative did, uh, in conjunction with some other organizations, did a lawsuit about bail. So now here in Baton Rouge, and I, know, I don't know if a lot of people understand this, but judges have to take into consideration a defendant's ability to be able to pay their bail. Because a lot of people in that parish are awaiting trial because their bails are too high. Yes. And I see you partner with Attorney Ryan Haley. Can you tell me about that? Well, we are excited about the fact that, not, I'm not going to say excited, that's the wrong word to use. Um, because of you know what has come down the Supreme Court with the um, with the Roe v. Wade being overturned yeah. and, and things of that nature, and and I'm just gonna say this, and I'm gonna say this because I'm I gotta be true with my family, right? I am 100% anti-abortion. What that means is I would never advocate for an abortion. I would never assist somebody in having one. I've been put in that position before, so I know what it feels like, but I'm not going to judge. Me too. But I am 100% choice. I serve a God that gives me free will and gives me the freedom to choose every single day. What I am on is the side of justice. And what we will not sit by and do is allow for people to be persecuted for making this choice. And take a woman's rights. Exactly. So we know we live in Louisiana, honey, and so they're going to start initiating what they call these trigger laws. Yes. So they're going to want to prosecute people who are seeking abortions. They're going to want to prosecute people who may be performing abortions. They're going to want to prosecute people for even advocating that you may even think about one, right? And women will die. Okay. They need to put that out there. So with that being said, uh, Fair Fight is, is partnering with the Haley uh, Law Firm to be able to help give uh, women who are women and providers or whomever who are targeted in this way an opportunity to have some quality legal uh, uh, representation. Some quality legal representation. And I say that again as someone who believes in the sanctity of life, who, you know, have been had several opportunities to have an abortion, has, has thought about it. Yes. You understand what I'm saying? 
I know the grace and mercy of my living God, but I do uphold the rights of these women to choose. Choose. Because God is a God of reconciliation. And what I do know is that if you do choose to do this thing, I know God can restore you. If you choose not to do this thing, I know God will take care of you. So it's uh, that's that's where my faith lies. Yes. But when it comes to this justice system, I know my my people in my community are going to be scapegoated. They're going to be targeted. Yeah. And so I'm very proud to be the executive director of an uh, organization that's going to stand up and fight, not only for their rights, but for the rights of all of my people who are being yes. Just victimized by this system, baby. We got to be honest and tell the truth about it, right? I love you. <laughs> well, I love you too, and I and I'm gonna tell you something. You know, we 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 are not a fractured community. We may think that we are, but as our as like what you're doing, our ability to come together and talk and to yes. learn and see how we intersect. Because I've been you before. I've been the single. Uh, 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 Mother, I've been yes. the uh, the teenage mother. I've been the person who yes. pleaded down to a case. I've been, you understand what I'm talking yeah, about? Yes. So even though I'm standing here in a position of hindsight, I don't forget where I come from. Right. You understand what I'm right. I know what it was like to be young during some times when we felt like we were out of control. And I welcome the youth. We've got to pass the mantle on to someone. Yes. You understand what I'm saying? And I know that we can make this world a better place. I know we can make our community. We could. We and could. we're going to do it. Together, can we just we say can... that in the affirmative? Yes. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. So to wrap it up, Ms. Linda, can you give us any contact information where we can reach you at? People, families mm -hmm. who are going through the same thing. Yes, yes. My mantra right now is tell your story. And I know it's hard. I know we live in an oppressive state. I know we live with a history of terrorists here. People who will come against you when you try to tell the truth. Yes. And a lot of times we have to check ourselves because when people come and tell their truth about what's happening when they are detained at the at the East Baton Rouge Parish Jail, we're going to change that. I'm telling y'all right now, it is yes. not a prison. It is a jail. These pretrial detention centers, when they come to tell their truth, we're more apt to believe the, the cops. Yes. Right? Yes. The corrections. And, and let me tell you, I'm not beating up on corrections officers because there's a lot of good men and women who are just simply trying to take care of their families. And they are thrust into a system that the culture yes. makes them turn away when they see things happening. Or it, it facilitates those people who have a, a, a prejudice or a proclivity to violence against others mm -hmm. to be able to operate in that. You understand? Yes. And I think it starts from the top down, right? But it's no different from when they judge I might be somebody who hang with people in the streets all day, but I don't be in the streets. Mm -hmm. This is just the people I grew up with. And y'all judge and quick to say, oh, see, he in the gang and this and that. That's it. So you, you part of this prison that's killing these people. And I think so. that's sometimes why there's a lack of um, uh, of trust between our young and our older generations, right? Even though we as an older generation, we know what we did out in these streets. We can sit in and try to act some kind of way all we want to. Yes. But we know life happens, right? Yes. But then we want to say, oh, you need to do this and you need to pull your pants up. You need to sit down. You need to sit up straight. You need to talk right. You need to go to school. To... Come on now. Really? Yes. Can we meet people where they are? Because that's what our Lord and Savior did. I promise you. Yes. He met people where they are. And then his spirit was allowed to change them through his example. You understand yes. what I'm saying? But with that being said, the East Baton Rouge Parish Prison Reform Coalition has always uplifted families. We've always wanted to empower families to know that they are not alone. And even though we may not be structurally sound, right, they may be able to go into the facility and get your loved one out or expose this or that, but yes. we've got to do it by the numbers. Yes. We're asking people to join us. You can find us on Facebook. Um, you can come to, you know, our our, our uh our website, ebrpprc.com. Uh, you can uh, direct message us. You can come out every third Saturday. We've been doing this for almost two years now. We do a caravan for justice. We ride around that facility blowing our horns and making noise. We want our people to know that they are not thrown oh, away. Yes. They're, They're not thrown not away. Alone. We love you. And we're working to have a community that is worthy of you coming back out yes. so that you can have opportunities so that you won't have to go back in because this system is a snare and a trap. Yes. And if we don't put some alternatives in place, really, really put some a alternatives in place. A lot of more families going to be hurt. Come on, baby. Come on. This system is, I tell you, it's a hot mess. It was a pleasure having you, Miss Linda. I love you and the conversation. Can't wait to have you again. I tell you, it was definitely my honor to be here to speak with you guys. And, um, 
I just know that this is going to do so much good. Not just because it's my story, but I hope that it can glean. We say we 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 uh, save by the word of our testimony, and I just I just hope that you know there is encouragement, and then also there is a call to action. You know, mm -hmm. come on and get involved in your community. Learn what's going on, yes. and and some of these laws and things that are are trying to be enacted. You know, partner up with local organizations like Vote and the East Baton Rouge Parish Prison Reform Coalition, the Power Coalition, and other people like that, the NAACP that are trying to do good things in the community for our people. Yes. I know there's been a lot of mistrust, but but there's a lot of good that's being done. There's always light at the end of the tunnel. Amen. Amen. And I also want to thank you guys for watching on another episode of Check on Your People, where we bring you the people that is for the people. Stay tuned for more episodes to come.